Welcome to What They Don't Tell You About Being a Survivor, a podcast that builds community amongst those affected by trauma with a purpose to promote healing and social change. As a reminder, this show is for mature audiences and the conversation might be triggering and or difficult for some to hear. Please respect and listen to your own body as you listen to what is shared. If you need to pause an episode or even stop an episode, there is no shame in that. We acknowledge that those listening will hear personal journeys that are like their own. There are resources listed on our homepage. If you want to talk with someone, please know there is help. There are people who care. You are not in this alone. We thrive in diversity, and as such, there will be people who have different views than you do, and that is a good thing. The world would be an awful place if we were all identical. There is no judgment in this space. As always, I am your co-host, Laura, and I would like to introduce our host for this episode, Mel Alvar, who works as the Safe Harbor Regional Navigator for ASA, Program for Aid to Victims of Sexual Assault in Duluth, Minnesota. Mel has a BAS in Public Health and has been doing community advocacy education in Twin Ports since 2004 and an advocate with PASA since 2013. As a Safe Harbor Regional Navigator, Mel is a point of contact for five countries and three tribal reservations in Northeast Minnesota for training, technical assistance, case consultation, referrals, and building capacity for walking alongside individuals' families impacted by commercial sexual exploitation and human trafficking. Hi, Mel. Hi, Laura. Thanks so much for having me today. Well, thanks for being here. January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So can you talk a bit about what the Twin Ports area is doing this January? Yeah, so what's interesting about my position is I actually do trafficking awareness all year round. And so this is really a month for us to bring communities together. And this is our actually our 11th year doing the Awareness Month in Duluth. But this is the first time we are recognizing the efforts and collaboration across the bridge in Superior, Wisconsin. I sit on a human trafficking response team over there. We partner with so many agencies and community members that it just felt natural to finally announce that. It's not anything that's actually new, but this is the first time that we are calling it the Twin Ports Trafficking Awareness Month of events. Our theme is healing through community. And really, someone had said something to me once about how powerful our words can be. And while there is still so much work to be done, so much work that has been done in our communities, I really wanted it to, our team came together and thought about like, how can we manifest more connection, more, I don't know what else, what other word I'm trying to look for, but but really, it's so the, the theme is healing through community. It's a message not only in solidarity against human trafficking, but also how we all can play a role. The theme in 2022 was we are connected. And as we saw with things that happened during COVID, we all became very isolated. And it was there was a lot of fear around getting back together with people. But there, there were a lot of people suffering in that isolation. So again, it's kind of just building off of we are connected. We are in this all together. We all have a part to play. We all have an important role to play because I truly believe, and you're with the program that you work at, it so resonates with me, the We Are Connected program or the Community Connectedness program and how in understanding the more that people are connected to each other, the less room there is for violence to happen. I I truly believe that in my heart. So I kind of wanted that to manifest with our, our message. And the other piece to our our theme is there is protection and strength and resiliency in our connectedness. And this is forever more highlighted in the collaborative efforts and partnerships in the Twin Ports, which is Duluth and Superior. We've been called the Twin Ports for as long as I can remember. And we're, we work year round to raise awareness, support those impacted by sexual exploitation and human trafficking and hold those accountable, those causing harm accountable. So we have a a month of events that many of which are still virtual right now. We were trying to figure out how to do hybrid. Sometimes we're not getting those numbers in person, but we also know that the importance of being able to be in person. So our opening ceremony was in person this year. We had about 90 folks show up to that this past Monday. 
It was held at ACO, the American Indian Community Housing Organization, who has been an incredible co-host and co-partner in collaborating these efforts. We opened with a youth drumming group from Cloquet, and Julian Kiddo was our drummer. They opened with a couple of songs for us, and it really just set us up in a good way to bring the community together to talk about our commitment to supporting survivors and continuing the work throughout the year and throughout the month. The other event that we had later that night was the Youth Brave Art Exhibition Reception. This event has actually been going on since 2016. It was put on pause because of COVID. It it started out as a one-day in-person event where youth artists would create artwork around what does bravery mean to you? We've all had to be brave for one reason or another. What does bravery mean to you? And how can we connect it to that theme of healing through community was this year's theme. But the first reception we had started at East High School, one of the high schools in town. It was created by a a Pabsi Youth Advisory Board with three very artistic members and they invited their friends to participate in the artwork. We had free food donated, and it was an incredible event that we wanted to make sure other folks in our community could access. So it moved from East High School over to ACO in later years and just expanded from there to include like performing art and music and poetry. And it was in community resources, actually. It it, it grew to be a very exciting event. And then of course, again, COVID happened. So to have that partnership from ACO to say that they could take it on and actually keep that artwork up in the gallery for an entire month is something I, I've dreamed about since the beginning. And the theme of Brave Art actually came from a survivor with lived experience of trafficking. We had asked her, if you could describe yourself in one word, what would it be? And she said, Brave. So forevermore, it's, it, Brave Art is, is called Brave Art for that reason. It's, it's really exciting that that event continues to happen, even if it's not being led by PAPSA. So we have a couple of other webinars, presentations happening, but yeah, those have been the ones that have happened so far, and we've just had excellent um, feedback and turnout for those events now that we're back in person doing these. That's awesome. And a lot of the listeners are not actually in Minnesota. Are there things that people from out of state, out of country can join by Zoom or some other means through the internet? Yeah, absolutely. So we do have, we've had national turnout for our webinars actually when we've been doing them online now. So there will be a link tree I think with this episode, folks can access our calendar right on that calendar. There are links to register for virtual events. They are webinars. The next one we're going to have is myth versus fact. They are because this is the Twin Ports and because we are Minnesota. I do focus more on what trafficking and exploitation looks like in Minnesota because that's where I work. That's where the folks impacted that I work with have experienced trafficking some of the time, so we do focus on our region, but my contact info is usually all over those presentations too, so folks want more information on how to get connected to services or who can do training in their area, there's a, I, I have a lot of connections to folks doing this work across, at least across the U.S., there are other opportunities with like Polaris Project and who runs the National Human Trafficking Hotline. They have a, I think they might have a global links to to other agencies and other people doing the work across the world. So yeah, there's a few different ways to find out how, how you can get involved, but I can only speak from my experience working in Duluth and working out of Minnesota, Northeast Minnesota, what trafficking and, and exploitation look like here. For those that are not clear, what is human trafficking? Yeah, so I start with a very broad definition first. Sexual exploitation, uh, human trafficking is a form of sexual exploitation, which is kind of on that broad spectrum of sexual violence. And human trafficking is not just a distinct form of violence, but rather a criminal legal concept sitting on the intersections of other forms of violence like sexual violence, intimate partner violence, teen dating violence, economic coercion, labor exploitation, child maltreatment, and and youth violence. 
And if we are looking at like a comprehensive public health framework of understanding human trafficking, we need to make sure to, to be looking at all parts of that. So I don't, I don't just want to silo human trafficking as looking like this one thing, right? There are so many different pieces at play. Um, so that's kind of my broad definition for it. And then when it comes to what it includes and what it can look like, it's coercion of another person to engage in sexual acts for something of value. So that's a form of sexual exploitation. This can, uh, that's something of value can be money. It can be basic needs. It can be drugs. It can be a ride, anything that's of value to that person, or it can be deceiving or forcing another person into performing sexual or other forms of labor under the conditions of abuse, extensive hours or pay extortionate debt, physical confinement, serious occupational hazards, violence and threats. So again, a very broad way of looking at what human trafficking is. Again, it is a part of, it does include commercial sexual exploitation. In Minnesota, that looks like exchanging something of value with another person and a third party may not be involved. So when that third party does become involved, legally that's what trafficking looks like so it's a type of commercial sexual exploitation that involves the prostitution of an individual where the third party not the buyer or the victim facilitates and profits in some way and it is receiving recruiting enticing harboring providing or obtaining by any means to aid in the prostitution of another that's minnesota's statute on sex trafficking Mm -hmm. and with our safe harbor law which i work under we recognize that minor children under the age of 18 cannot be and should not be prosecuted for engaging in the crime of prostitution and should be looked at as a victim of a crime and not every state in the united states has this safe harbor law in this way so we not only decriminalize it for 17 and under, we also provide services up to age 24 without a disclosure. They can, they can simply be potentially at risk or seeking services themselves to qualify for safe harbor services. While I'm on the terminology and definitions, I just want to clarify I'm not an expert in labor trafficking and exploitation, but it is a big piece of human trafficking, and I do strongly believe that because it is so hidden, it's not given as much attention. I fear that it's happening more than we think it is, and it could be happening at higher rates than sex trafficking is. And because the more communities like lack the training or awareness on that issue, that's where I worry that there could be higher rates of it happening because people just don't know what to look for or how to identify it because it's, it's meant to be very hidden. What do you mean by labor trafficking? Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna get into that. Um, so labor trafficking includes exploitation as well. So that includes debt bondage, which happens when someone's under another person's control and the debt cannot be paid back with reasonable work due to fraudulent practices by the employer. It can also include forced labor, which can involve physical harm or restraint, abuse, threats, threatening abuse of the legal process, withholding identification and documents and use of blackmail and then there's labor exploitation that's a part of that and that's happens when services involving the violation of labor laws protecting how workers are treated how much and when they are paid health and safety and how children under the age of 18 can work and as well as wage theft with labor trafficking and exploitation I, th- I do believe we have to pr- be proving that force, fraud, or coercion that the federal law has, but when it comes to sex trafficking, it's by any means. It doesn't have to strictly just be through force, fraud, or co- coercion for it to be considered sex trafficking. So we kind of lower the barrier of proof a little bit there in Minnesota and really with our safe harbor law and services, we have some intervention plan in place with our with the law we also have a no wrong door model which essentially says anyone who is working with youth or any door that a youth walks into if they're experiencing trafficking that professional should be able to recognize that and offer services Mm -hmm. and treat them with trauma-informed care 
and positive youth development, if that's what they want, is the other side of it. Our services under Safe Harbor are really driven by that person's experience. So we can offer the services that are in our area, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it meets the needs of that individual. Right. And you did mention services that you guys offer. What kind of services do you offer to somebody? Yeah, so it really kind of depends on the situation because if we're identifying potential signs of grooming or that that there's potentially some needs that aren't being met or they need safety planning, the first and foremost, I would see if they would be interested in working with a case manager. And really services across the state kind of vary. So some we so we have let me step back for a second we have nine regional regions and 11 regional navigators and each regional navigator site some do have supportive service grants that are supplemental to that regional navigator grant that we get through the state so those services can be anything from advocacy to legal services to mental health some have housing or shelter and so it'll kind of depend on what that youth's needs are going to be and because PABSA doesn't offer shelter services that's probably going to be what we're looking at first do they have emergency shelter needs what is their day-to-day looking like and if they just are someone who would be open to building a support circle we might put them in touch with a case manager a youth advocate It kind of really depends on the person and the situation and who they're willing to work with and what that relationship looks like with the person who is introducing those options. So we really want it to be person centered and looking at that whole, the whole person. And then what, what is the family situation? What kind of support does the family need? Because we want to be looking at them too as a part of this, this healing process and moving forward. Thank you. And Just to highlight something you were talking about there about like who they're comfortable working with. I don't think we talk about that nearly enough that somebody who's experienced trauma for various reasons might not be comfortable working with someone even though they've never met them before. Would you care to talk more about like some of, I mean, there's could be a lot of reasons, but just to give some examples. Yeah. So the thing about just I think trauma in general is it right trauma rewires our brain so the impact of that trauma is going to depend on who it was who caused it what my coping skills are did I try to disclose it before was I met with victim blaming all of these things are going to impact my journey forward so when it comes to that person And this is the thing that I tell professionals, first of all, is when we're working with survivors or if we're looking for people who have been impacted by trafficking, because there's a lot of talk happening right now around screening and identifying and offering services, I would really like us to take a step back and and make sure we're we're checking in because disclosure should not be our goal. Mm Trauma-informed care across the board needs to be our goal. If we are meeting people with compassionate, non-judgmental, consistent care, and they come in 10 times and we're just checking in and we're opening that door for them, we cannot expect that a disclosure is going to happen on that first meeting because there are people that I had worked with years as an advocate and didn't get a disclosure for probably three years. And that was a that was a male identified individual. And statistically they take anywhere from three to seven years to disclose, but it takes that long mm-hmm. for some people to build trust because especially when it comes to the act of this crime, human trafficking and exploitation, most of the time folks who have been impacted have been taken advantage of and exploited by someone who swooped in and said, I saw you needed help and I'm here to help you. I can help you. I can take you out of this situation. I can make your life better. And then, so then like this grooming process and trauma bond happens in some situations, not every situation, but the majority of the folks I've worked with, it's been this significant relationship has been established. So then the trauma coercive bond happens and they're told, You know, it's us against the world. Anyone out there who tells you differently is bad, they're wrong, they're out to take us apart. So then if I come in as a professional and say, 
you're being trafficked and that's your trafficker, they're going to walk right out the door. I would never say that to somebody. It would be about how, how is it going? What is, what is your path forward look like? I'm not trying to change your mind about anything. I'm here to let you know that there are services and things we can put you in touch with if you want, but that person needs to be able to recognize for themselves that they want something different in their life. And that, and that's been for the majority of folks that I've worked with. I know there are survivors who have had significantly different situations where it's not with someone they've formed a trauma bond with, but I can tell you as someone who has wanted to call myself a helper and had that rescue mentality before I've learned very hard, the hard way that we should not be out there just trying to rescue people. We, we want to empower them with education and information so they can make that decision for themselves what the next steps are going to be because they are the experts in their life. And so that help seeking can look different from person to person because maybe I look like somebody who has harmed them also. So me saying you're safe with me, I can help you is totally misguided. And that can go for any professional. They can look, they can talk, they can smell like something that's going to trigger them from their trauma. So we need to be very mindful of that. And that's why I simply say it's not simple because it's a process. I simply say that if we are meeting everyone we come into contact with, with trauma informed care, that's just, that's assuming everyone's been through stuff, right? So we have to be we have to be gentle. We have to be ready for the unexpected because we don't know what their life experience has been like. So we can't be out there fishing for disclosures because it's never going to happen. We may never be that safe person for somebody to disclose to, but when we are, prepare for it. Prepare for a disclosure. Be mindful of what your body language is saying, how your face is reacting. Are you reacting with shock and disgust? Because that's also... What they're waiting for is to see, yep, if I disclose to her and tell her everything that happened to me, if she looks at me like I'm disgusting, it's going to validate exactly what I felt about myself. And this is why I'm never going to talk about it again. So we need to be mindful. And, and I, I sometimes tell folks, like, there really isn't anything that I don't think I haven't heard yet when it comes to these experiences. I've... I, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. But if that's not part of your journey, I don't need I don't need to know that. That's for you. Hopefully, I didn't get too off on a on a tangent there. But I really I think that's where sometimes well-meaning folks who really want to do helpful work and meaningful work in this work, we need to listen to what they're saying. Some of them are saying, we don't want help. We, we want you to show us the way, but we don't want you to tell us what to do. Like lay the options in front of us. That's being, that's, uh, I, I do this panel that's actually coming up this month called the Aftermath. We, it's discussions with survivors, survivor experts of sex trafficking, and they, they call it the human approach. We don't want to label it victim centered. We don't want to label it just necessarily trauma informed because the human approach should be all those things. Talk to them like they're humans. Don't put them in a box because of their victimization. They are so much more than what has happened to them. And that's where that person centered, like strength based. Again, it's like strength based also is put into this sprinkled into this human approach is really looking at and focusing on how how they've survived all of this they they have strengths they have goals they have other things that they're focusing on in their life and are are pulling them through every day and we have to highlight that we have to honor that and we have to celebrate that i'll stop at that for now (laughs) thank you so much for sharing that and i love that term the human approach because like i've brought up in a few episodes sometimes I'll hear someone say they've never experienced trauma and you think about like intergenerational trauma and it's like, how has nobody experienced trauma? Talking about it. And it can be something as simple as a very empathetic, well-meaning person that unfortunately looks like somebody that caused the harm and Mm -hmm. not being aware of that. But I can't imagine going through some painful experience and the first person I turn to help ends up looking like the person who harmed me. 
Like, how would exactly. you even vocalize that? Exactly. Exactly. And, and for so many folks sometimes, too, depending on, like, the length of their, how long they were being trafficked for, too, right? Like, they're, some are, some are kind of stuck in that survival mode. So when we come into contact with them and we're giving them this list of like, here's all the things you need to do, some folks aren't going to be able to retain literally anything of what you're saying. If they are living day to day trying to figure out how to eat, how to stay safe, how to protect themselves, and again, this isn't every single case, uh, every single situation, people who especially are experiencing high complex trauma could be stuck in that survival mode so we need to be mindful of how we're talking and how we're not judging them for how they're behaving or how they're showing up sitting in front of us right because how they're interacting with us is painted by their trauma experience or in just an experience in general and two i think for people who can identify that they've never experienced trauma what a privilege that is because that probably means that you've had a lot of support and you've you were taught good coping skills and all of these things when i think of trauma too i think of like big t little t like the the trauma that's life changing and can change the trajectory of your life and your what lens you're looking through in the world how it paints the world around you and then the little trauma the little t trauma i can't remember exactly what that was where that comes from but little t trauma can be like these stepping stones that we it does take some effort and some coping and support needed to get around it but it's not something that's going to change the trajectory of your life and so i think that's that's interesting to people because we've all been through stuff it's just who is in our circle mm -hmm. who is, what access have we had to healthy coping skills or that support circle and uh it, actually back to our twin course opening ceremony that we had this week we invited leanne little wolf uh, she's the executive director at aco and i could i'm her biggest fan i could listen to her talk all day but one of her trainings she was talking about trauma-informed care and found a definition on resiliency. Uh, and I think she said it came from Harvard. I, I don't have a link for that. Please don't quote me on that. And maybe don't, don't quote her on that. But she talked about resiliency being not only what is within us, but who is around us. Like, we, there are not many things we can do on our own. We really, it really takes a, a circle of support to pull us through things. So yes, we wanna recognize that inner strength and courage, but some people out there, especially who are stuck and feeling stuck in exploitation or intimate partner violence or other situations like that, if they don't have a circle of support, where are they gonna get that encouragement and empowerment? There is gonna be someone out there along the way that they're gonna feel safe enough to, to take that hand, to pull out, right? We have to do the work as those of us, you know, in, in, the, in the deep of it, we do have to do a lot of our own work, but it, we literally can't do it all on our own. There is, I think, I hope that makes sense. Like we have a lot of internal work we need to do because people also need to feel confident enough that they deserve a better life, mm -hmm. deserve something different. Like what is your why for moving forward every single day and I, I bet if you, you know, if we surveyed a hundred people impacted by any form of trauma or violence, their answer would be different. What do you hold on to every single day? Some people, it is another person. Some people it's, I don't know. And that, that I think is one of the most beautiful things to witness is that resiliency and courage that people have every day. They've been through the most horrendous things we have ever heard of. And to still be full of life and full of dreams and full of life, like that's the gift working in this work mm -hmm. that I that we get to witness is that resiliency. Thank you for sharing that. I also want to highlight you mentioned safety planning, and that's a term that sometimes gets thrown around and people, unless someone sits down and actually does one with them, might not look know what that looks like 
So can you explain yeah. a little bit more about what safety planning means and involves? So within working with folks impacted by human trafficking or exploitation or intimate partner violence, safety planning will look different for everybody. Because again, first of all, we have to recognize that my idea of safety is going to look very different than that person sitting in front of me. I might think that even going into a certain situation, like just stay away from that. That's easy for me to say, right? Because I am not actually in their experience in their day to day. So we really have to ask them, what would help you feel safer? What does safety look like to you? So we really have to come at it from a harm reduction approach of we recognize that this could still be a very dangerous situation, but what piece of it could still keep you safe. So for some people, it is looking at maybe getting another phone, but what's gonna happen when that phone is found, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's things we have to talk about. What could be the consequences of this being found or this not working? So you, you really have to work through some of that. Another thing that we talk about, especially with professionals, is don't just assume that it's going to be okay to hand someone, uh, you know, here's, here's Pabst's crisis line card, put this in your pocket. If that is found by somebody, again, that could be very dangerous. So putting numbers in a phone with different names, you know, like a code name, like I'm not going to put Pabst's number in my phone as Pabst, I'm going to put it as Pam and know that PAM is PAVS's crisis line. Having plans in place if people don't feel comfortable calling law enforcement. What, who else can they call? Where could they go? Where are safe places in town to go if that's, if that's what it arises to? So it's really gonna be, again, that human approach, looking at someone's circumstances, what tools do they have available to them do they have a network of support? Is there someone else? If they don't feel comfortable calling a crisis line, we hear that all the time too. They're not gonna call a crisis line. Okay, who can they call? Sometimes when folks are working with advocates, we do have Google voice numbers, but we're not, we don't, we can't guarantee those are on 24 hours a day. Those are just a couple that I like to mention off the bat because usually lately it has been a lot of phone requests that we've been getting, people who don't have access to a phone or their phone was stolen or taken and having a phone helps them feel safer. Some don't want to have access to the internet. We've gotten phones for people who are just flip phones because their traffickers had put monitoring devices in there in the technology of their phone. I that again, I'm not an expert on that stuff, but we did have one uh, individual that we were working with who were, was giving us feedback on like, oh, could we get some of these phones, these bags that are essentially protect from somebody maybe hacking into a phone. So we've looked into things like that to have available if folks are worried about their technology. So yeah, safety planning can look very different. Another tool that we use locally is we have a pocket guide that we use. Uh, it is in the folder in the link tree <laughs> so we'll be linked with this event our our pocket guide is in there the template actually came from a trafficking prevention curriculum called not a number by love 146 so we get to fill it in as facilitators and on there it has definitions of what is consent what is exploitation what is human trafficking and then at the bottom there's a, a space where people can put who their safe person is and who who a friend is that they can talk to, who a supportive adult is, because just without talking about it, let me step back, sorry. When we talk about it, when we write out plans like this, it helps to build muscle memory. So when a crisis does arise, even practicing, leaving or practicing having conversations as a part of safety planning builds muscle memory. Mm -hmm. So the more that we're revisiting that and fine tuning it, we can't guarantee also because of survival mode, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, we can't always guarantee that that's gonna click on when something actually happens, but we can try, right? We can try to have this safety plan in place. So having them write it out in a place where they can keep it safe. This pocket guide can too also maybe be not safe for somebody to have on hand, but it is something that we use as a tool with some of the youth that we work with. 
here in Duluth. Mm-hmm. I hope that was kind of, that's kind of very general and <laughs> vague yeah. out of safety plan, but. No, it's good, and I'm glad you brought up the phone stuff because just listening to you talk, I was like, oh, keeping track of one phone, making sure one phone is charged, remembering where you set your phone down uh, can sometimes be a lot, especially if you're going through a lot of stress or in survival mode. But just the reality of trying to keep track of two phones and making sure two phones are charged and one of those phones is never discovered, I mean, just like that, I imagine it would be like a constant fear, like they're not going to find it, and how do you have it near you but not discoverable? Because let's face it, a lot of phones aren't that small, especially if we're talking about flip phones. And also the fact that given technology, phones can be hacked. And was it Safe Haven I was at or somewhere that they have a container that people can put their phones in so it's like soundproof or something and I mean this is a reality for a lot of people and I know not that many years ago when this victim started saying hey this is happening and they were ridiculed for being paranoid and now it's like oh wait it actually is happening and that's the thing unfortunately like when I do my presentations on human trafficking, I cannot, I do my best, but I cannot capture every single person's experience, right? So sometimes when we do come face to face with someone impacted and their, their experience is like, I hear, unfortunately, I hear that all the time from some of the adults that we've worked with. It's just like, nobody believes me. They're like, people think I'm crazy. People think this isn't happening. And unfortunately, there are some very smart, tricky abusers and traffickers who that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're gaslighting their victims. They're gaslighting the people they want to continue to manipulate and control. And we're feeding right into that when we don't believe people. So with with human trafficking, honestly, anything can be possible. But just, and I don't say that to scare people because we also need to be like, we need to be mindful of those myths, those rumors, those misconceptions as well. Okay, I don't I don't want this to explode into like, oh, Mel said all the conspiracies are true. Like that's a whole other thing. I do appreciate awareness of human trafficking, but we also need to be careful how we're talking about it. Because especially out on the internet because there's there's a lot of harm in talking about what it spreading those those rumors that are out there on um, on human trafficking, and I'll name a couple of specifically and why they're harmful. So, tra- first of all, the one we hear a lot is traffickers always kidnap their victims. So it's mostly stranger abductions. Anytime on Facebook I see something about like an attempted stranger abduction, it's immediately taglined with "This is human trafficking." I can tell you, yes. Kidnapping does happen into trafficking, but the majority of the folks that I've worked with in almost, oh my gosh, how many years have I even been here now? It'll be eight years this year that I've been with PAPSA. I have not met very many that that's how they were taken into trafficking. Okay, so we need to be mindful of using that like always, never language, right? And then the next one would be victims of sex trafficking and exploitation are all young women and the traffickers are always men hopefully this is a pretty obvious why this is harmful because if we're only looking for girls we're not looking for boys or gender diverse youth or people or men anyone of any gender identity can be um, has been trafficked by a trafficker and traffickers can also be any gender identity the only piece with human trafficking that the statistics remain pretty along that line is the the buyers we do see as being mostly male. That one we do have data to back. I think the mapping the demand um, for sex buyers in Minnesota is a resource that I have in that resource folder. Consistently, that's what we're hearing, at least for that piece. So, and that has a lot to do with who has power, who has money, and how this continues to happen. 
but the other pieces, traffickers and those affected and directly impacted by trafficking, they can be any gender identity. And, and so why is it harmful? It's harmful because it creates those significant barriers for those impacted. So if I'm someone experiencing trafficking right now and you're telling me that traffickers are all looking a certain way, that they, it only happens by kidnapping, I'm not gonna recognize that my partner is the one exploiting me. Hmm. And it reinforces biases. So I, I'm very careful these days of talking about potential indicators especially in community settings, because we still have that gender bias. If I tell you this list of potential indicators, more likely than not, I'm seeing those referrals come in that are only for female identified folks. We are missing the boys and male identified folks out there experiencing this because it's not looking exactly the same for them. So I'm very mindful of that when I, I it, it does look, my trainings do look different for professionals, but I do emphasize like we have to, if you're gonna be screening, you gotta screen everybody. You don't just screen female identified folks. It also further stigmatizes, especially when historically, the person being identified as the trafficker in the media and movies, and this can open that whole can of worms, has typically been labeled a black man. That's a, that's a whole other conversation about criminalization of hyper-criminalization of black men. And then it also creates barriers, again, for those who are actually in a place to support survivors and victims. Because again, if I'm not looking at males as potential victims, then I may not offer the same services or support that I would if I think I'm identifying a female. So it, it creates a lot of barriers. It creates a lot of harm. And so we need to keep listening to survivors we need to look at the data it's a hard thing to track i can't tell you how many i can't give you data on how many survivors are out there because we're also looking at like do they even identify as victims and where did this research come from and like again like i had said in the beginning it intersects with so many different issues that we're never going to be able to capture what that exact number is and the only data that we really have right now, the baseline data is, this resource is also in the resource folder, is looking at some of the Minnesota student survey data. We have a question, there's a, a Minnesota student survey that goes out every three years. It's, it's similar to the CDC survey. This one is directed from the Minnesota Department of Health and Minnesota Department of Education. And in 2019, a new question was added to the survey for ninth and 11th graders. And the question was, have you ever traded sex or sexual activity to receive money, food, drugs, alcohol, a place to stay or anything else? So it's assessing essentially sexual exploitation. We're not asking about third party benefit here. We're asking about that trading sexual activity for anything of value. And at least 5,000 youth in Minnesota answered yes to this question in 2019. That's 1.4% of students in our state. And while this is a, a very large number, unfortunately, I think this is just the, I think the number is a lot higher than that because I think about our students who, who are experiencing exploitation, who weren't in school that day, who felt some kind of way about answering this question. I think about our youth who just weren't uh, even given this survey because the school district can um, offer the survey, the school can decide to not offer the survey, and there's, I just don't, I think it's, anyway, it's a baseline because it's the first time we've asked this question, and soon the data will be coming out because the survey was just given last year, so I think it's going to be really interesting how that number has changed since COVID. Mm -hmm. And so the other briefing, it, it was, sorry, the study was done. It's called the, the Minnesota Youth Sex Trading Project with the main U. I think the data is, is in that resource folder, but they did create a briefing that breaks up the map of Minnesota to show where the safe harbor regions are. And so in my region, Northeast Minnesota, 1.5% of Minnesota students answered yes to that question compared to the state. And then it breaks it down by gender and race. And this is, this is where it's 
like we're hearing from these youth that in my region, 1.5% of cisgender boys answered yes to this question. Actually more than cisgender girls. So cisgender is folks whose gender identity aligns with their biological sex assigned at birth. So that the data that I have for my region actually shows that we're seeing higher rates of exploitation in boys than girls. And then we're actually seeing overrepresentation in the numbers of youth who are transgender or gender diverse. So to me as a service provider, that tells us that we're not doing enough to lower barriers for those who are gender diverse and creating safe spaces for them in our communities. And, and we have to do better because this number, 5,000 youth is just, it's, it's too many. So that's a little bit on like on the myths and our a little bit of the data that we have. And there's other, you can see statistics from like the National Human Trafficking Hotline, how many people are calling in. They have some very interesting data to show as well, like the trends that don't really align with the myths that are out there and the rumors. The last piece I did want to mention though, since I was talking about this Minnesota Student Survey data, is again, we don't just want to identify these folks by their victimization. I do want to highlight that of the youth who answered yes to that question, they do have plans for after school. Those who answered yes to trading sex, 63% of them have dreams of higher education. 16% of them have work or career training dreams and goals. 7% have plans to join the military and 14% have other plans after high school. So again, it's just important to look at them, them more than just a statistic that they have a lot of other things going on in their experience in their lives. Yeah. And that, like you said, that number is way too high. And looking at them as a whole person that has so much to contribute to community and that really speaks on the importance that community needs to have to support them now through this developmental phase of their life that is being interrupted by trauma. And I know the theme of this year is healing through community and wondering if you can talk a bit about how people can help. Yeah, so there's, it's really, again, looking at the human approach to to what you have capacity to do, what, what, do, what do you have access to to be able to give? Some people want to give their time and, and energy into certain things. So I, I'll, I just start off by saying start by believing people. This goes for any form of anything be a safe person for someone to come to again don't don't go out there looking for disclosures or expecting them but the more we create that safe space for people to feel comfortable talking about their story sometimes that is the first step right because being shut down by the first person you disclose to is is setting people up for a really rough uh, and even more traumatizing road so first of all start by believing people who disclose to us their experiences the other things that we can do is model and start conversations early and often with all of the young people in our lives every single one i have a my son just turned four years old and we actually practiced refusal skills and how to tell mommy if something happens we have conversations all the time about body boundaries there's no tickling in these situations we don't and and you come and tell mommy if anything like that happens and he actually like enacted like running home to come and tell me it was it was incredible anyway so start that conversation early and often there are a bunch of books out there that people can check out I think the book that I bought for my son is called Consent and Body Boundaries. We, I will find that link. <laughs> so we're talking about consent. We're talking about body autonomy, how we help take care of other people by asking that consent, healthy relationship dynamics, how to leave an unhealthy uh, or confront an unhealthy relationship before, maybe before something happens. Again, practicing kind of like safety planning, building that muscle memory and that confidence internet safety what is what does internet and technology rules look like in your house those are important things to have conversations with young people about i also want to touch on um, for young people there are websites out there like defend young minds and fight the new drug about talking to our children about early exposure to pornography 
because we are seeing a direct connection to other forms of violence happening and just a lot of brain development that can be stunted when, when children are viewing pornography at, at a young age. If you, ha- if you are in Minnesota, you can consult your concerns with the Safe Harbor Regional Navigator. If there's something in your community you're concerned about or you want to find out how to get involved directly in your community, yeah, to connect with the Regional Navigator. All the contacts are on the maps that are in the resource folder. Follow Duluth MN Trafficking Awareness on social media. We're posting about our events there. We do have some social media images right now that was actually designed by a friend of ours at Men as Peacemakers that we've been using for about three years now. Make sure you're vetting harmful information that's out there. If you're seeing data shared, who is sharing that data? Where is it coming from? I get I get messages like this all the time. Mel, is this actually happening? Can you, you know, I'm kind of like on their checkpoint for vetting information. Keep learning about human trafficking and and the intersections of it. How is it happening in your community? Here, we have intersections with other social issues that we're experiencing. We have high rates of people experiencing homelessness. We have a housing crisis. We have a mental health, a lack of mental health services. People with substance use disorders not getting enough services or access so those are other issues that are intersecting with it how this is happening in our community other than the fact that there are traffickers out there looking to take advantage of people with this that they identify as having vulnerabilities so i'm not going to get into the whole offender profile type thing but so educate your community the more that you're learning have these conversations with people do they know what's happening in their community and connect with local organizations working on the issues that are doing the work in your community i hear a lot of there's amazing things happening in other countries with other organizations outside there is so much happening here on the ground too so make sure you're doing your research and finding out who is who is doing the work on the ground and stay stay curious stay open again people with lived experience are that are the experts and i always feel weird when people are like navigators are the experts in their region i'm learning every day new things about how to approach how to how are we looking at this issue from a community level from a state level because it all trickles down and that's the public health approach right we have to look at what are the structures in place that trickle down to the individual experiences that how this is even happening. It's not just one thing. It's not just one person. What was the circumstances? So really looking at that whole picture. I got off track for a second there and lost what I was gonna say. So we'll leave it with that. Those are just a couple of ways to take action. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love hearing people talk about ways to take action and when you were talking about working with your own child and it can be difficult for parents like you know you need to talk to children about this but how do you do it in an age appropriate way especially like you don't want to frighten them and like all this stuff are you familiar with the fight child abuse youtube channel i know there's so many resources out there it's like you probably yeah, I yeah. Haven't, i haven't heard of that one no i love their videos and i've posted them before but on other episode descriptions, but they have different playlists like protect yourself rules, specific videos for K through third grade. Like they're made specifically for those kids. And then they have ones for fourth through sixth grade. They have a teen series. They have one like stop the secrets that hurt. And they have videos on how one that comes to mind is how a friend could like start sexually harassing you into a way that you feel that you have to have sex with them and it's set up for teens so just there's so many cool resources and I just saw that they posted a new video three weeks ago that I haven't seen so honestly when we're done recording I'm going to be watching that but yeah they they're beautifully done and they're powerful and the newer ones you know I think they're improving with their skills so that's awesome. I love to hear that there's so many more resources because I can tell you when I started as a youth advocate, I was like, there is no, there is no curriculum out there for folks, younger folks. So what, what do these conversations look like? And so 
there was a program who actually asked me, how do you talk about sex trafficking with youth and children without saying sex trafficking? I was like, here you go, consent, internet safety, body boundaries, body autonomy, uh, creating opportunities to build self-esteem. That's, that's the basics at the bottom. And if we don't do it, I recognize, I recognize the fear and uncomfortability, but I'll tell you what, the cost is so great if we don't have those conversations. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to because potential abusers, offenders, and traffickers are looking for those youth that nobody's looking for, that nobody's talking to, that people are ignoring, that people aren't interested in. They are going to fill every single one of those needs. And something I talk about in my presentations usually is that Maslow's hierarchy of need. And so they are, they are very smart. Offenders and, and abusers are very smart at finding where those gaps are um, and filling it and saying, I can, I can take care of all of this for you. So we need to be the ones to do it in, in our families, in our community. And that's why I, you know, my ways to take action usually involve like starting in the home first. How are we talking about other people? Are we objectifying other people in front of our children? What are we watching in front of our children? Are we paying attention to our children? Are we on our own phone? Are we having conversations with what, you know, apps they have? Because yes, and, and this is parent, again, this is, I think where it gets difficult and tricky too, because everyone has different parenting styles too, right? So I'm not gonna get into like, this is how you should because I have a four-year-old. I don't know what I'm going to do <laughs> when he's old enough and is asking for his first uh, smartphone because I'll date myself. I didn't get one until I, I got my first phone when I was 16. It was that block Nokia, right? And I resisted for years even getting a smartphone because it, I was just like, that's ah, too much. This is too much access to my life. Uh, and that's not how it is anymore. And us as adults just need to be like, I don't know anything. You teach me. You teach me what you're up to on there. And do it from a non-judgmental, you know, place. And if we genu genuinely show interest in what they're interested in, it can open doors. So, yeah, there's different places out there you can find how to have those conversations. I'm not going to. Yeah. Go into and too much detail there. Just a highlight for people too, because I don't think, I mean, kids are innocent. We like to think that they're innocent. They should be innocent. And there was that one study and I cannot remember the number of it, but it is a shocking number of young kids we're talking like that are sending sexual pictures to adults. I can actually, I don't want to freak people out more, but I do actually have some of that data and I can put the link in the chat if you want to link it. Um, it's to Thorn. So Thorn is a website that takes, like that's their main focus is looking at uh, child sexual abuse material to get it off the internet. And they also have, I don't know exactly how it works, but they scour the deep web and they're scouring everything on the internet. And I've actually heard too that they can, if they find someone who's viewing child sexual abuse material, there's like a message that's like, you're being watched and here's some resources to get help. That's a very generalized way of describing what they do. But they did look at self-generated child sexual abuse material. So that means that this is child abuse material that was appears to have been taken by the child in the picture. The imagery can result from both consensual I mean, legally they can't consent, but consensual or coercive experiences, and kids will often refer to consensual experiences as sexting and sharing nudes. So they, this is what's formally been called like child pornography. We're stealing, steering away from that language because it is abuse material. And um, let me find my slide on the data. So Thorne's latest research monitors the evolution of youth attitudes and experiences with self-generated sexual abuse material, as well as the perceived normalcy of non-consensual resharing of another child's mm -hmm. material. The data also underscored heightened risk among boys.
minorities and Hispanic Latino youth. That was interesting data that came out of this past year. There's the link to that data. So they interviewed 2,000 or did a survey with 2,282 minors across the United States. It was an 18 minute survey from October 25th to November 28th, 2021. Their sampling was for nine, nine to 12 year olds. They got responses from 659 youth. And then for 13 to 17 year olds, they got responses from 1,623 youth. So in my, my recent presentation, I wanted to highlight that minors overall, particularly 9 to 12 year olds, are more likely to follow established online safety rules in 2021 as they were than they were in 2020. So they do follow the rules, which is good to highlight. Not everyone out there is. Anyway, I like to highlight the positive first. But since 2019, there has been a sustained increase in minors self-reporting that they have shared their own nudes. In 2021, as in 2020, approximately one in six minors reported sharing their own self-generated child sexual abuse material. This includes one in seven minors, nine to 12 years old, and one in five minors aged 13 to 17. Two in three minors, which was 68%, have ha- uh, who have shared their own have also shared it within the past year. Um, there's a lot more data in there, so that's just some of it, but that is a huge piece that I think we need to catch up to date on is exploitation that's happening online, and it's starting with access to being able to, to share nudes and explicit photos or being threatened to share nudes. Yeah. And, explicit. and it's just that too, like they're being threatened. I know that there was one case of that boy who was tricked into it and then later committed suicide, like within hours, because he was so afraid. So encouraging people not to like shame, but to be curious and have these conversations with children in a loving way that they feel safe to talk about this stuff. Yeah, and it's especially important that non-judgmental piece of like, if you tell me something happened, you won't get into trouble. That's the other thing that I think parents struggle with is it's like, well, I'm trying to keep them safe. I'm going to take their phone away. Well, now they're feeling like they're victimization and now they're being punished for their victimization. They didn't ask to be, you know, for this to happen to them. It happened. And I'm sorry, parents out there but like if you, if your child is online with technology they will be solicited for photos we need to plan for it they they will come in contact with somebody if they are online and we can't we can't deny that and we can't ignore that anymore we need to prepare for it but put those tools in their toolbox of what how do you report how do you you know, how can you safety plan on social media? Unfortunately, it's it's a it's a reality that we're just seeing explode right now. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Is there anything else you were hoping to talk about in this episode? Um, I don't think so. I think that kind of covers everything that I wanted to mention. Um, I do like to wrap up by saying and just emphasizing again that trafficking doesn't happen in a vacuum that harmful attitudes and beliefs and practices create an environment where violence and exploitation can be normalized. And when we show up for people with no judgment, with consistent care and compassion and respect that they're the experts in their own life, they will rise to the occasion and take care of the rest. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all the work you've put into making January human trafficking in the twin ports. I know that's a lot of work, a lot of activities, a lot of time and energy. So thank you for the work that you do. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me highlight it. I, I actually, there is one more thing I, I did want to read if that's okay. I do have a letter the person who gave us the name for Braveheart, that person we had asked if you could describe yourself, she she wrote two different letters that she she printed herself, and I just, I think they're incredible, and they come from her heart, and they're to anyone she said who needs them. So I want to read one of the letters that she wrote, if that's okay, and then we can end there. I believe in you to keep thriving in the things that are important to you and the way you choose to live your life. I 
believe that when self-doubt overwhelms you and takes over your mind, that you can accomplish anything you set your mind to do. That you have many talents and the wisdom to use them to your highest potential. I believe that when you are uncertain, you have what it takes to overcome obstacles and grow from every experience life brings your way. I believe when fear takes over your soul that you will find strength in your courage and compassion in your heart. I believe in your goodness that most most days you have forgotten about. Even when you don't see through to the other side, I believe you will get there.